Hello everyone, my name is Daria, welcome back to my channel. And today I'm going to be filming a booktube favorite, a staple of the community, if you will. And that is reading negative one-star reviews of your favorite books. I have actually attempted to film this video before, but looking back on the footage, I feel like I was just like a bit too aggressive. So I'm gonna try like my darndest not to do that today. I'm gonna try to be super calm, super chill. I'm gonna try to like see the other people's perspective and try to understand them. I don't know how well that's gonna go, but we'll see. And hopefully I don't have to scrap this video as well. So I thought that we would start off with King of Scars by Leigh Bardugo. I have talked many times about this book, how I know that it is probably people's least favorite out of the entire Grishaverse. I am fully aware of that, and yet I also love it with all of my heart. The first reviewer says, I couldn't even finish this dot 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 thing. King of Scars or King of Fan Service? Was King of Scars full of fan service? I would honestly say that Rule of Wolves was more so like fan service. Spoilers for anyone who hasn't read it, but a lot of characters come back in that book. So I would say if anything, Rule of Wolves is more so fan service than anything. I'm not sure if this person is saying that like Zoya and Nikolai are fan service. I hear that a lot about that ship and because they are my favorite Grishaverse ship in general. I do take that as a personal attack. I really do. I really don't feel like the Zoyalize ship is necessarily fan service. I can understand if people aren't invested in them as much so as the other couples. I think that they match each other very well. I think they're very similar in the fact that they put on this kind of performance for other people, but inside they have a lot of secrets, a lot more complexity going on that they don't outwardly show. Also, they're just both really hot. It's two hot people making out. Like why? Like I'm not gonna say no to that. Uh, this person DNF'd the book and goes on to say, I feel like this book only works if you're a diehard fan of the Grisha trilogy and then it works only barely. It's not a book that can stand on its own. You need to have read other books by Bardugo to understand the world and its characters. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. I understand where this person is coming from but I also don't think that Lee ever said that you can read her series like out of order. I'm pretty sure that she's mentioned that you can read like the Six of Crows duology on its own but I believe that when it comes to King of Scars you have to have read the other books. I don't think it's like a Cassie Clare thing where she really tries to like explain the world. Actually you know what at this point Cassie Clare just like doesn't even explain the world anymore. You just kind of get dumped in there. I think that when authors say yeah you can pick it up like anywhere that you want to like I don't think that they're telling the truth. I really don't. Nina mentioning Matthias 50 times in her first chapter. I get it she misses him it's changed her but if you haven't read Crooked Kingdom or just don't care about it you won't care about her sorrows either. Past events aren't explained properly but they're all this book's about so it becomes hard to feel invested. I knew going into this that it was just going to be about how all these previous books and everything that happened impacted these characters, how Matthias's death impacted Nina, how the civil war in Ravka impacted Nikolai and Zoya. Also I'm just a huge Helnick fan so the fact that she mentioned Matthias so often I was like eating the angst up. They then go on to say in the Grisha trilogy Nikolai was my favorite character, he's great. Unfortunately he's not really much in this. Surely he's there on the page, big parts are about him but you don't actually see much of him. It's as if there's a cardboard version of him standing there with catchphrases coming out when you push a button. All the characters don't feel fleshed out. All the times that we've seen Nikolai previously, we are seeing him from another person's perspective. We are seeing someone else's perception of him. So of course Nikolai is going to seem different now that we are inside of his own mind. If anything, I prefer the King of Scars version of Nikolai that we get a more nuanced character versus in the Grisha trilogy where it was Alina's perception of him. It was this, like I mentioned before, this performance he was putting on. We saw little glimpses of his vulnerability, but in general, we really just saw this like cocky, charismatic, kind of guy, which was fun, but I want more than that in my characters. I've mentioned this before in my Six of Crows review, but Bardugo's banter sucks! Ooh. <laughs> it's incredibly unnatural and out of place. You'll have characters making snarky comments in completely serious moments or sarcasm is just out of place. I love that. Are you kidding me? I use humor all the time in the most uncomfortable situations. I love that kind of humor. I love dark humor. I love it when people crack jokes in books at the worst possible time. I think that the banter is fueled by who the characters are and their relationships to one another. I think the perfect sort of example of this is in Six of Crows where originally all I think all of the characters are talking about how to kill somebody and then Matthias is like 
you're all terrible people. And then in the next book, they're all doing the same thing and they're looking at Matthias like, hey, and he's like, I think those are all great options. And it's so funny because it's grounded in the character's development. It's grounded in the developing dynamics between all the characters. So I heavily disagree. I heavily disagree. The next book we're going to cover is Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe. It's a book that I absolutely adore. It is everything good and pure and soft in the world. Cannot wait for the second book to come out. I will definitely do a reading vlog or something along those lines because I'm just, I'm so excited. It also comes out in October, which is my birth month. I can't wait. Anyway, now that I've talked about how much I love the book, let's talk about someone who absolutely hated it. I was so excited to read this. Everyone fucking loves this book. Listen, this book had zero plot. The title is misleading. The characters are so fucking boring and lame. I just disagree with everything this person just said. <laughs> I can't acknowledge that this book has a very slow moving plot. I feel like this is a constant complaint about my favorite books. Like I love character driven stories. I love slow paced novels. When they say the title is misleading, I wonder if they thought maybe this was like a sci-fi adventure. I find that so funny. Like imagine you go into this book and you think you're gonna get like a Star Trek, like Star Wars kind of adventure in space and them trying to discover like stuff about the universe. And then it's just a book about two very soft, sad boys. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dante was a cute character. That's all I can say for him. But fucking Ari is so useless and such a jerk. Dante deserves the world. Okay, so I need to step up to the plate and defend my boy, Aristotle. The whole point of the book is Aristotle's struggles, his inability to sort of accept himself and thus accept kindness from other people. And I think that it was personally a joy to see Aristotle come to terms with who he is, accept himself and all of his flaws, become closer to his family, find friends and find love with Dante. That is the whole point of the book. So to just dismiss him as a jerk, um, yeah, I don't like that. The next book I'm going to tackle is Normal People. Once again, a book that is entirely character driven, entirely internal, has a very slow moving plot. If any book is going to like epitomize my reading tastes and how much I love slow moving books and plots, it's gonna be this book. So I'm looking forward to seeing what people have to say about this one. This person says, whoa, dot dot dot, guys, dot dot dot, I just finished Normal, dot dot dot, Man, okay, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Um, I'm just gonna read it as if there weren't all the ellipses because this, this is too much. This book is everywhere right now, being highly praised and all that, as it should. I've never felt more disconnected from a story. I couldn't care less about either of these characters and I definitely didn't care about anyone else in the book. I wish it would have at least ended with an apology for taking up too much space in the crowded book world. Wow. <laughs> I have to sort of concede that this book, it's not gonna seem that interesting. Not only is the book very slow moving and very internal, it also has a structure in which there are like no uh, quotations. So I totally understand why someone would think that it is boring and not really capturing their attention. However, my rebuttal please. I think this book is just so realistic. The way that Connell and Marianne just never seem to like sync up, the way that they are unable to voice what they truly want because they themselves don't know what they truly want. The whole back and forth of I love you, let's have sex, do whatever you want, we're different, I can't tell anyone about you, I love you, I'm seeing someone else, and it really feels like this should be a YA novel, but it pushed the characters ages up just a bit to say nope 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 these are adults here we have adults coming through this is adult fiction it reads like twilight without the vampires but someone gave this bad boy a mint okay okay so obviously this reviewer does not like YA. obviously has a lot of preconceived notions about it i don't like the fact that they used the genre of ya to belittle normal people just because you don't see the merit in something doesn't mean that it's not worthy of the man booker prize whatever it won yeah, this review kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, the other ones, like, I wasn't really upset, but this one, this one kind of, I'm like a little offended. Next, we're going to cover the graphic novel Pers Police, which is just a book that I absolutely adore. I think that it is so personal to me because the story that it tells about a young woman growing up in Iran during the Iranian revolution, it reminds me of so many stories that my family has shared with me. So now let's listen to people trash it, okay? This person wrote, around the year in 52 books, 2017 reading challenge, a book with illustrations. Okay, so they, we're completing a reading challenge. Good for you. I never really participate in those because I can't stick to a TBR for the life of me. I'm like such a mood reader. So had I known what it was, I would never have gotten it. I don't like graphics. I'm not interested in the history of Persia slash Iran. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay. Oh, why is that funny? That's not funny. 
this reviewer doesn't like graphic novels. They are not at all interested in the history of Persia or Iran, and they don't care about the life of this woman. So they read this book. Why? I'm not interested in the history of Iran and Persia. Why is that? Why is that? It's it's kind of giving me like slightly prejudice vibes. Like I don't I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Honestly, I just feel like this person kind of played themselves. I don't know why you read this book. <laughs> why. The next reviewer kept it very short and simple one sentence. The author comes off like a narcissistic psychopath. Okay. <laughs> I can maybe understand why you think she's a bit of a narcissist. I think when she gets older in her like 20s she can be very like self-centered and has kind of an ego and sometimes you look at her and you're like girl like why why are you doing that? What could have possibly led you to make that choice? But I mean isn't that how all 20 year olds are? Plus cut the girl some slack. Okay she had to like leave her country and her entire family behind. She lived through a fucking revolution like I think we can give her a bit of a break. So the next batch of reviews is all about the saga comics, particularly the first volume. I absolutely adore the saga comics. I don't really talk about them as much on my channel because the comics have been on hiatus since like, oh my god, like 2018? Holy shit. Anyway, the story is basically this like space sci-fi epic. It's basically about the planet and that planet's moon and both the species are in this huge civil war. It basically impacts the entire universe. It is specifically about someone from the moon and someone from the planet who will fall in love and have a child and basically everybody in the entire galaxy wants to kill this kid and find these parents. I absolutely adore it. I think it is some of the greatest world building and character development that I've seen in any story. Listen, I understand that this is a media darling, but I find it very hard to enjoy story, books, comics, etc., where the world that is featured and spent time in is a world where it's completely normal to enslave. Okay, I'm not gonna read that out loud, but I'll put it on the screen. I can understand where this person is coming from. This series tackles very, like, heavy, triggering material. It includes things that are mentioned. It includes an entire planet that is basically just dedicated to terminating pregnancies. If those are things that you don't want to read about, that you don't want in your fiction, I totally understand. I would say that like the entire series is dedicated to these things. I think they are present in the worlds, plural, these characters interact with and go to. I also don't think it's normal at all. I don't think that you see any characters that you are meant to sympathize with doing these kinds of things. It is meant to be something abhorrent. It is meant to be something that we look down upon, that the characters look down upon. So I don't think it's normal. I think there are certain characters who are disgusting, who like normalize it, but we as the reader and the characters, the main characters, don't believe in that and are actively opposed to that. Okay! So we are here. We have arrived at the portion of the video that you all have been waiting for. I'm sure that you slogged through the beginning parts to get here, or maybe you just used the timestamps to get here. Either way, welcome to the Pride and Prejudice section of this video. I have quite a few reviews picked out. We're gonna be spending a bit of time here. The most overrated book in the history of literature, the plot borders between meaningless and trivial. <laughs> oh no! Power through, power through. I was forced to read the book in ninth grade English class. Pause there because I feel like this totally changes the tone of the review. Listen, I sympathize with this person because I have been forced to read many a novel that I have not liked simply because I was forced to read it. There have been so many novels I've read in class and then I've gone back later on when I've chosen to pick it up myself and really liked it, really enjoyed the experience. So already I am sympathizing with this person and I am not holding this review against them. For several pages a lady remarks to a man about what wonderful handwriting he has. <laughs> not exactly gripping material. I disagree. Oh I know exactly what portion of the book they're talking about. I think that that is an incredibly gripping part of the book. The book itself is bad enough but to complicate matters women pledge allegiance not only to the book but also to the gazillion hour movie. Ew. See, I was really like sympathizing with this person and not trying to judge them or be too harsh. But then they, they just, they had to sprinkle in just like a wee bit of misogyny at the end. Stop hating on things just because women like them. I can't fucking stand this. And you know what is so ironic? Austen and other like female authors of her time were constantly ridiculed and belittled for writing novels. And people thought that it was just like bullshit because women were writing it and women were reading it. And the misogyny is still alive, obviously. I just ripped a piece of my hair out, damn. I was like really sympathizing with that reviewer until the end there. Austin created stiff one-dimensional characters, brought them to life as much as she could in a boring plot and had two of them fall in love somehow. No one writes romance colder than Austin did. Jane Sweetie, I am so sorry. I am, I am so sorry that this person would ever say that to you. I am so sorry. 
I don't think her characters are stiff or one-dimensional in any sense. I think that maybe her background characters like fit a certain archetype, but they still like function in the story as they should and they're hilarious. So no one writes romance colder than Austin did. That's just like a lie. It's not good to lie in your reviews, friends. Then the reviewer goes on to say, readers wanting a classic with a plot that's actually interesting should grab Jane Eyre instead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I, I don't, I don't like Jane Eyre. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't take this seriously. Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre. You're gonna say that Jane Austen writes romance cold, but you're gonna, then you're gonna recommend Jane Eyre. How are you going to insult Darcy and Elizabeth and then recommend freaking Rochester? This book has been billed as one of the greatest love stories in all of literature because that's what it is. I have no idea why. Okay. Elizabeth Bennet is smart, independent, and not overly concerned with bagging a husband, which by the standards of Victorian England, which this book is not set in, it is set in Regency England, makes her a feminist trailblazer. Then she meets Mr. Darcy, who acts like an insufferable prick. Fast forward, by chance Elizabeth finds herself touring Darcy's palatial estate, meeting his hundreds of servants, using his solid gold bidet, <laughs> and suddenly she starts thinking that maybe Mr. Darcy isn't such an asshole after all. The moral of the story seems to be that enough money can make even the most abrasive and obnoxious jerk seem like Prince Charming. Okay, uh, time for my rebuttal. At that point in the story, when Darcy and Elizabeth meet again at his home, Darcy has really gone through a transformation. And Darcy has really come to realize some of his own faults and is actively trying to become a better person. Like, that's the thing here. The story, everyone thinks it's just like, eventually because the rich guy has enough money, she comes around. Like, no, she comes around because the dude actually works on himself and proves that he's a good person and they actually have a lot in common. Also at the time, pretty much everybody married for money. If Elizabeth meets a hot dude and he happens to be rich, like, wh what the fuck do you want her to do? Turn him down and then she'll be like a feminist icon? Like, I don't... Also, I feel like this reviewer is implying that because she chose to be with Darcy, that means that she's not like a feminist anymore, which is just uh, bullshit. I don't think people realized at the time, it wasn't an option for you to like not marry somebody if you were a woman. Like you had to marry somebody and you had to marry somebody who had money. This person goes on to say that this is the biggest piece of anti-feminist dribble. Once again, refer to what I said. It was not an option for women not to get married. Like that's, that's what you did. It kind of grinds my gears a bit when people try to apply like contemporary feminist standards onto like female characters in classic novels because it, it's just it's not going to apply like they don't have the same economic opportunities that we do like it's not possible for them so like don't say that she's anti-feminist because she got married like you know, pissing me off i don't know how this book came to be so overrated jane austen is a dwarf compared to great authors such as joyce dievsky orwell huxley calvino balzac stendhal gogol and pretty much every other author I can remind or think of in the second, I'm guessing. They're all men that he mentions. You know what? This is a long ass review. And I, I'm just, I'm not gonna bother. I think that that intro paragraph said as much as I needed to know, and I'm not gonna read it. And I think that's my prerogative. I don't know. I just feel like a lot of critiques of Austen, just, like, there's always just like a hint of misogyny in there. Like, just a, just a little sprinkling. Sometimes it's very overt. Other times it's just like, sprinkled in there a bit. So that is it for me today, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Go ahead and let me know what you thought of this video, what you thought of my rebuttals, what you think of these books that I mentioned yourselves. If you want to find me or follow me anywhere else on social media, all the links will be down below. I love you all very dearly, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye!